I'm assuming that that all of you here understand the gravity of this situation, but I'm going to reiterate the gravity of this situation, partly as I said to John, because I, I look to key into the reptilian brain stem of the people that I present to, not to scare them, but to get them on the alert. And I'm offering this presentation today to the future audience that I hope that you will bring me to of the people that you work with who don't quite get what we get, how, how disturbingly dangerous our reality is. This is where it all starts and ends. Very famous photo. It was a gift from NASA to humanity. It's the most published photo in the history of, of humanity, I'm told. This is the logo that I assemble all of my work behind for the past decade. So you'll find various websites with that logo in there. Whenever you find it, it has something to do with my fingerprint there. Those are hands. The world scientists warning to humanity, a very, very powerful framing for what we face. But there were two of them. First, 1992, the Union of Concerned Scientists in America issued a warning, published a manifesto signed by 1,700 scientists, including, I believe, over half of the then living Nobel Prize laureates at that time. Did we change? What happened? Well, not very much happened. In fact, the New York Times in a full magazine section of 60 pages in length basically said the environmental movement failed. Fast forward, 25 years later, late 2017, propelled by one particular scientist and ecologist from the or Oregon State University William Ripple, Bill Ripple, realized that when you remove the keystone predator from an environment, from an ecology, that the whole ecology starts to fall apart. He discovered that removing wolves from an ecosystem, the trees started to die. With that concern, he assembled a group of, a small group of scientists to write a peer-reviewed article this time. The World Scientists Warning to Humanity, Second Notice. Very powerful. I think they should have called it Final Notice, but this leaves room for yet another warning because humanity has to be shaken many times before we wake up. At publication, it had been signed by over 15,000 scientists from around the world. Another 8,000 have signed since then. When I came across it, I spoke with, with Bill Ripple and I said, you left out one very important group, stakeholder group. He said, oh, what was that? I said, the public. You have no way for the public to get involved. So we got agreement from the Alliance of World Scientists, the group that formed out of this warning, that I would put together a public interface. And that was called simply scientistswarning.org. Now, the warning talks about ecological stressors. There are many. I'll just mention a few of them today. They overlap. Each one of them would be sufficient to, to get very scared of. Biodiversity loss, food systems, what we eat, how we grow it, how we ship it, the, the entire system, I'm told, contributes about a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. How much of it we waste? Freshwater scarcity, growing more and more pronounced in various nations around the earth. Marine life depletion, related to ocean pollution, but not the same. There are many causes for both. Again, overlapping, but not equivalent our destruction of the forests. I don't call it air pollution, I call it air toxification, because air pollution 
we, we know what air pollution is. We've been breathing polluted air for decades. It's like we're still alive. We are toxifying the air. Low birth weight babies are born in cities that have toxic air. We've de degraded soils around the planet. We continue to lose soils and degrade them because of our farming methods, which are based on chemical agriculture rather than natural ecology, ecological agriculture. Population, of course, the elephant in the room, the sacred cow, and climate change. The most serious of all of these stressors because it's coming at us the most quickly. In my usual presentation, I go into each of these, but today I'll only go into a few. Biodiversity loss. That's a graph from a few years ago. When they extended it out in time to 2012, they found that 58% of wildlife has been lost since 1970. And this came up in the news again with another article in the last couple of weeks saying 60% has been lost in the last 40 years. <coughs> Same idea. We're not talking about s species extinction. We're talking about the numbers of various species that have been lost. The biomass of the animal kingdom and the insect kingdom. We have done this. That speaks for itself. Most of humanity is concerned very little with biodiversity loss because we don't educate people. They don't understand that we depend upon biodiversity for our own existence. We've got enough cows for McBurgers and enough chickens for McNuggets. We're good. This is getting into the mainstream media. It's not completely there, but it's getting there. From Bloomberg Businessweek, new climate debate, how to adapt to the end of the world. The seriousness is getting some attention. Now what's left out there is the advertising that was on that internet page, which is arguably one of the causes of all of this. But I'll get into that more later. Let me go into climate change with some depth. This is the extent of the Arctic sea ice cap in late summer 1980 when it's at a minimum. 2007. Now, lest there be statisticians in the audience who understand that I could be cherry picking with two particular dates, this is the data set from the University of Washington. The lowest, the bright green, is the September, the month of September. They had to refigure this because previously they thought it was a linear decline in sea ice and they realized it was an exponential decay. And by those who study the sea ice, the ice pack, it's predicted that in the next couple of years we will see an ice-free Arctic in late summer, in September. Now this is in very, very stark contrast to the IPCC's report, which says at 2 degrees, well, we'll have, excuse me, at 1.5, we'll have one ice-free summer every 100 years. Excuse me? Now, I wear this emblem. I don't work for the UN. I work at the UN. I attend their climate talks every year, and I do a television program by having repurposed their press conference room. I want to go to one particular part that is revealed and very revealing, the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. Let's look at, look at it in a Mercator, a flat projection. It's about 2,500 kilometers long. It's about 350 kilometers wide, but it's only about 70 kilometers deep, deep. And so the methane that's being emitted on the East Siberian Arctic Shelf mostly reaches the surface. It does not dissolve in the water. Methane from deeper ocean sediments dissolves in the water column. And it's estimated that there may be 2,000 billion tons, 2,000 gigatons of methane stored there. 
from when that ledge was a above water level back in the days of Pangaea. Now, let's take a look at the data. On the left, November of 2008, the red indicates the most serious concentrations of methane that were read from satellite data. On the right, November 2012, I unfortunately don't have a most recent view that would co we could compare, but you can see by 2012, we were already having millions of square miles of ocean that were releasing methane. Call your attention to the lead of the three scientists who contributed to this work, Dr. Ira Leifer, and here is Dr. Ira Leifer. Atmospheric scientist from UC Santa Barbara who said in 2013, I'll break the quote into three parts so you can read it with me. Some scientists are indicating we should make plans to adapt to a four degree centigrade hotter world. While prudent, one wonders what portion of the population could adapt to such a world. My view is that it's just a few thousand people seeking refuge in the Arctic or Antarctica. Now, one man's opinion, obviously a studied opinion, cause for grave concern. I want to show you four maps of the planet. This data was compiled by the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. The first map is data the next three are projections, computer projections. Let me point out the scale. This is a relative drought map. So you'll notice that the region of the Sahara is green and yellow, not because it was moist, but because it was usually dry in the first decade of the century. But you'll see red appearing in a few areas. Those are unusually dry areas. So let's move to the one-third point, then the two-thirds point, then the final decade of the century. 2030 through 39, 2060 through 69, and 2090 through 99. But you don't have to get all the way to the end of the century to see the destruction of our agricultural ecosystem that will be occurring by then. And when I present this ordinarily, I say, unless you like a lot of toast, we have toast in most of the areas by the end of the century where food is produced. What that will do geopolitically boggles the imagination. Unless you think that it'll take until 2030 to get there, we're already getting there, but I can't give you the headlines in this presentation and make my time budget. I will say one part of it though. When forests get dry, they burn. Crops die, but forests burn. And this year was a particularly shocking year with a California fire, fires in Greece, Sweden, Japan, not known for its forest fires, Siberia, Canada, that's a different kind of hothouse effect, Lancashire, UK, all over the world. And to understand the problem clearly, it helps to graphically understand the effect of our past, our historic CO2 emissions. We are producing that much heat. 400,000 times per day, 365 days a year. That data is from Dr. James Hansen, arguably the Paul Revere, the first scientist to go public. And he had to fight governments in the United States from that point on, both Republican and Democrat who tried to silence him. An article in The Guardian recently from Mayor Hillman, very well-respected social scientist, 
we're doomed, Mayor Hillman, on climate reality no one else will dare mention. The 86-year-old scientist says accepting the impending life of mo- the end impending end of most life on Earth might be the very thing we need to help us prolong it. And I'll read this part. The outcome is death and it's end, the end of most life on the planet because we're so dependent on fossil fuels. There are no means of reversing the process, which is melting the polar ice caps, and very few appear to be prepared to say so. So why is the impending life of, uh, why is the impending end of most life on Earth almost ignored in the news media? How can that be? And what should we do? Now, at this point, I'm going to hand over the uh, microphone. Okay, thank you. So, um, I wanted to talk in this section a little bit about what it actually means to be human and what and how we feel about what is actually happening and what feels to be around the corner for us. And the first slide talks about the sense of an ending. And I've picked that title because we have the sense of an ending looming and being around the corner. But I also, want to, I also wanted to speak to the point about what is the sense of this particular ending. And I've picked on this title also because um, Julian Barnes wrote a book which was entitled The Sense of an Ending. And in a sense it speaks to our current predicament because the point of the book is that the main character, the main protagonist in the book, who was approaching the end of his life, reflected on things which to other individuals were entirely obvious and he couldn't see the point. He didn't get it. And I feel that that, in a sense, is a metaphor for humanity in that what is happening to us, we, don't, we simply don't necessarily see it and we aren't getting it. I think that's a key point that I'd like to make here. Um, as humans, we have a sense that life will continue, that we will wake up in the morning, that the sun will rise, the sun will set, and that life will continue as we've, as we've come to experience it. So we are, we are, in a sense, programmed to do particular things. The psychology of the human mind is such that we filter information, we recognise patterns, and we have expectations. Um, we are um, information processors par excellence, and we move into automatic mode. And our lives at the moment are very much geared around particular scripts, whereby we get up in the morning and we go to work and we end the day, we eat, and then we do the same thing the next day. Um, we expect that things will happen, something will happen next, and that it will be pretty much as it always has been. And what we've become immune to, in a sense, is the sort of the slow burn of what is actually happening. One of the reasons I'm here and not in my day job, which is Pro Vice Chancellor at a university in the UK, is because I've decided I can't just simply sit back and do nothing. So I've decided to talk and come to any meeting, any forum where people will have me. Um, <laughs> and there is the pub the night before. <laughs> and there's that, yeah. Um, and actually talk about these things, because I think that talking about them within social media and so forth just isn't going to get us anywhere. And having end, I, I, I sit in endless meetings at work and we talk about growth and we talk about, um, we talk about markets, we talk about financial plans and so on, and we talk about business as usual and, and, thing, and things don't actually change. So my sort of contribution to society, in a sense, is just to get myself out here and, and talk and stir things up and just be a little bit awkward and be a bit difficult. But, you know, that is my way of preserving my integrity. OK. I wanted to say a little bit about the apparent linearity of life. And I wanted to... This is, this is a poem that most people will know. And I, and I like it. I like it because of the passion within the poem, because it speaks to that aspect of human life. It speaks to death. Death is something which I think we all find rather difficult. Death is very personal to us as individuals. There's something very powerful and very shocking about thinking about death on, on a mass scale. So when I personally went on my, my particular journey, which, took, which brought me to this point, and I suddenly realised that what we're actually looking at is the potential death hundreds of thousands of people and that was a, that was an absolutely terrifying prospect what i like about this poem here do not go gentle into that good night old age should burn and rave at close of day 
rage, rage against the dying of the light. It fa- it's, it, it's an articulation of the value of life, of life as something that is, is not to be, we should not be sleepwalking into our deaths, which is, which is how it is perceived within the media um, and out there. We, should, we need to resist, we have to fight. We have to fight not just for our own lives, but for the lives of everything else on this planet. And that means being passionate about things, it means doing things differently, um, it means ourselves being radical, it means thinking about things like civil disobedience, it means forcing governments to actually tell the truth, which isn't actually happening at the moment. Okay. Um, I'm also associated with Scientist Warning and I'm associated with a group in the UK called Extinction Rebellion. And Extinction Rebellion is in a sense a grassroots movement which, which is advocating civil disobedience and it's doing that on a large scale. So the objective of Extinction Rebellion is to have as many people who are essentially like me, who simply do not want to put up with the status quo, who will actually stand up, go out there on the streets and ultimately be prepared to be arrested, which is quite a scary prospect. But I think that's where we are in society. You know, we're looking at a situation where nothing is really working and civil disobedience is one option to us. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about networks and we all have networks. I have a LinkedIn network, I have a Facebook network and so on. And there's a perception, I think, that our networks are powerful by virtue of the fact that we have so many people in them. What I would like to suggest is that the the very size of those networks doesn't necessarily assure us of them being effective. Um, in a sense, what I'm proposing is that to be effective, I think what we need to think about are smaller networks where we have smaller groups of individuals that have very tight and closely knit relationships. So for example, I've used um, myself, Stuart and John here. So if you think about this particular configuration here of just three individuals, it looks like a simple network, but in fact it isn't. Because I have a perspective on John, I have a perspective on Stuart, they each have a perspective on me. Collectively, Stuart and I have a take on John, John and Stuart have a, we have a strange take on me, um, and vice versa. And then there's a group of the three of us, we, we each have a perspective on the group as a whole. And that's quite complex when you think about those different ways in which the different elements will see each other within the group. Think about a larger group and think about the number of transactions that would need to take place within that group. And it quickly becomes it quickly becomes apparent that those larger groups cannot be as cohesive and they cannot be as effective. So my proposal is that in order to be effective, I think we need to have smaller groups that are united around common themes, common interests, and have at their core a shared trust. Okay. Death. I picked this particular quote from a paper by David Wasdell, who I, I admire greatly. Um, and he talks about birth as the arch- archetype of bereavement. And it's a very interesting paper in which he suggests that the process of the, the fetus developing within the womb where there are unlimited resources is in a sense analogous to the situation we find ourselves in. So as humans, we've enjoyed the sense of un of of finite resources, we're now coming to that point which is rather like birth in a sense, whereby the resources are being eroded, they're becoming ever more, ever harder to access, and we're actually approaching something which is in a sense like a kind of birth, except in our case it's going to be a death. And I think that's a very powerful way of thinking about what is actually happening, I think it's a very powerful metaphor for what's happening to us at the moment. Um, in order to effect change, you guys, just as Stuart and myself and John, will, will be faced with denial. And I think it's a useful exercise to try to consider the, the denial that might exist within us. You know, are, we, are we fully facing the challenges? Are we fully facing what is actually happening? Um, there's a difference between actually reading the facts and looking at the information and absorbing the, the horror that Stuart has just put before us. There's a difference between reading that and understanding it, but actually feeling it and internalising it and saying, my God, this is really happening. So I think it's a useful exercise to consider whether, whether there are vestiges of denial within each of us, and if there are, what are we going to do about it? You know, are we just going to come to work tomorrow as if this didn't happen? That's the question I'm putting out to you guys. 
Um, there are different kinds of denialists. Um, I see denialists in terms of dichotomies or contrasts between sceptics um, and challengers. There's, there are denialists who take the form of active contributors who will actually contribute to the denialist discourse and those who denialist consumers of denialist discourses. There are confident denialists and then there are doubtful denialists as well. And it's a useful taxonomy in thinking about the kinds of issues and the kinds of people and the kinds of groups that you might find yourselves having to deal with because you guys are being tasked with trying to effect change, trying to, have, trying to implement policies that are going to be fit for purpose in terms of what's actually happening to us. The, the key point that denial, denial and denialists have in common is that they all want something to not be true. But it is true, because what we are facing is the edge of the precipice, and we are, we are looking at a catastrophe. OK. I've put some links up here um, to Scientist Warning, um, to Jem Bendel, who has talked about deep adaptation. Um, deep adaptation is an approach that talks about um, resilience, relinquishment, and restoration. Um, the key point about Jem Bendel's work is that he is now openly indicating that collapse is inevitable, that near-term collapse is inevitable, and therefore what he's talking about, the kinds of strategies that we need to implement and think about to adapt and to be prepared for that. And then the final point is, um, the final link is to the Extinction Rebellion page on Facebook. Let me take it back over for a few minutes and race through a, a whole bunch of slides. But first, I want to go to a realization. I've been teaching this for several years, audiences around the world. When I first taught it and put it on YouTube, it went viral. About a quarter of a million people have watched um, the video, both on my site and on other people's sites who downloaded it. Okay, global civilization has an operating system. I don't know any other professor who talks about this. We have a global operating system and it's seriously flawed. The operating system is known by two common names, money and economics. But I use the word economics carefully because it's a particular brand of economics that has made itself the only game in town, the only game in human conception virtually. It's called neoclassical economics, installed about 100 years ago by J.P. Morgan and a few of his cronies. It's the one that benefits the bankers the most. It's also called growth economics and mainstream economics, interchangeably, or just economics. So every time you read that in a newspaper, economics, they're talking about neo. First, we have to identify the disease. So money. Money is a virus of the mind. This is not an analogy. This is what it is doing to us. It's called a meme. The old meaning of meme, not the internet meme. A meme is an idea which passes itself from person to person, generation to generation, society to society, society to society. And this particular meme of money uses humanity for its own reproduction. We are not seeing the forest for the trees in this case. We see the money in our pockets. We see the money in our credit cards, in our bank accounts, but we don't see money as a thing that controls us. And money is turning the natural world into more money as fast as it possibly can. It's taking a rich, luxuriant, natural world with millions of species still yet to be discovered and churning out more money nature becomes resources to be turned into human capital, financial capital in particular. The strangest part is that money itself anesthetizes the host, us, so we can't even see this as a problem. In mainstream economics, nature is termed an externality. 
which means that it doesn't matter. And this is taught in nearly every university on earth. Nature is an externality. The gentleman Nordhaus, who just won the economics prize this year, Nobel Prize, his contribution on climate change was that he said that agriculture only represents 2% of the global GDP. So if climate change harms agriculture, it doesn't make much of a difference. Excuse me? The economics prize, by the way, was not a Nobel Prize. It was added on in 1968. It's the bogus Nobel Prize that the Swedish Royal Academy baptized. From the poorest to the richest, we need to recognize money owns us, not the other way around. Even the richest cannot step away from what they do. And they were hand-selected by money because they are the best at ignoring the consequence of their actions. This is the model, the textbook model of economics. Money goes from consumers for, to businesses for stuff. Labor goes from individuals to firms, corporations, in exchange for money. That's the circulation. The money accumulates mostly in the firms, some of it in the households. But what is missing from this picture is my question. There is no notion of an earth. There is no notion of ecosphere, ecosystems. There's no notion of, of equity, of ethics. It's all left out, all ignored. It makes no difference to the invisible hand of the market. The human economy exists within this and cannot exist without it, and that is ignored by the current economic system, neoclassical growth economic system taught around the world. So let me move to interventions. And I'm going to have to move quickly. I want to throw out some ideas, some big ideas. We need to moderate money. We need to get control of this thing which now controls us. Very quick and simple way to do that. Simple but not easy. To increase the reserve requirement for all banks from 10% gradually to 100%. So banks would only be able to lend out their money that their depositors have on deposit. Right now they can lend out about 10 times as much money as they actually have. Much more. Much more. And they are incented to do so. Well, with, it, with a 10% reserve requirement, they can push money out there as fast as they possibly can, which is why now when you step off an airplane, the first advertisements you see in most airports are advertisements of, of banks. They want the businessmen coming off to borrow from them. Money supply, this is just US money supply, exponential growth in the money supply. We must require all business schools, all economics majors, all candidates for degrees in business and economics to study ethics and ecology. Right now, who cares? Who cares? Want to start small. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't say only. Yes, okay. Lawsuits. The time has come to sue governments and corporations. It's a wild idea, but the people in this room could sue the EU. There is grounds. Recently, Urgenda sued the government of the Netherlands and won, saying you're not doing enough on climate change. They were backed by a massive amount of public support. In the United States, 21 youth plus James Hansen in the back row there, suing the US government. Obama could have settled with them after Trump was elected declined to settle with them, and now look what we've got. We've got Trump who's steamrolling over the, the climate protections that were in place. It can be done in locales. This is the state of Washington, where a smaller group of, of children are suing the government of the state of Washington, which is arguably one of the more progressive states. Civil disobedience, the time has come. This young girl, I'm sorry.
sometimes I can get through without weeping. This young girl became a hero this year when she staged a one-woman strike against the government of Sweden, and she sat outside their parliament saying, I don't give a hoot about your law that I have to go to school as long as you don't give a hoot about the world that you're, you're handing to me and my colleagues, me and my friends. I'm bringing her to the UN Climate Talks this year, and I'll do four presentations with her, four of my TV programs. It's starting in the UK, the Extinction Rebellion. We hope to spread it to the world next year. I'll be doing one of my programs with the Extinction Rebellion people. Refuse to fly, very meaningful here, where I'm sure part of your work is to fly constantly. When we have very low expense now, video conferencing can be done with hundreds of people for free. Telepresence, what you're seeing is very high function, where you can see the looks and the expressions on people's face intimately. You can see all the wrinkles. It can be used for conferences when required between heads of state. But you can use ordinary low bandwidth Skype and Zoom. And I'm not advertising, but I use Zoom now, which is for $15 a month, I can get 100 people sharing the internet with me. And I'm asking you to take a look at Drawdown. It's drawdown.org is the URL. I'll have it later, which presents the 100 most effective means to reduce global carbon emissions and to increase withdrawal of carbon from the atmosphere. And these are grassroots kinds of things. Reforestation, which can be done by individuals, organizations, but it doesn't need to be a UN mandate. Educating girls, one of the top two, because it reduces the population growth to educate women. This is a high bandwidth video conferencing where someone can actually walk with the person that they are talking with through their routine. And these, this woman and her two children, her two girls, live on a raft and cannot use kerosene safely because their home and the island on which they live in, Lake Titicaca, would burn, could burn. But this solar panel allows her children to be educated to do their homework at night safely. So this book is very, very valuable. It's a free book on the internet. You can buy it, but all of the solutions are there. Okay? Moving towards a plant-based diet, we don't all have to go vegan or vegetarian. Just the movement towards a plant-rich diet would be very powerful, also healthier for us. The bottom line is that we all must become active immediately to avert a catastrophe at our doorstep. For our children, ourselves, and for all of life on Earth. Please, individually, you can join scientistswarning.org, scientistswarning.org slash join, and you can join as an individual, and I'm hoping that maybe we can get some movement in the EU to actually endorse the scientists' warning. Thank you very much. <laughs>